Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's um, webinar. Really pleased to have you. Can we just have the introductory slide? Is that okay? Fantastic. So, welcome to everybody. Um, the, this morning's title, um, what we're going to be talking about is working with the NHS to improve patient flow using virtual wards supported by inpatient care, or in-person care, I should say. So, welcome everybody. Um, just to introduce myself, if we could go on to the next slide. Um, I'm Tim Strawn. Um, I work for NHS England and Improvement. I'm a director in the Personalised Care Group um, and um, also director of NHS at Home. Um, and um, in terms of the format um, of this morning's um, webinar, um, I'm joined by hopefully um, three expert speakers. We're still waiting for one of us to join, um, but I'll introduce those um, guys in a moment. Um, but I'm going to start with um, just a bit of scene setting, if that's okay. Then I'm going to um, just do a bit of a, an overview of um, virtual wards from a, a national perspective, um, which will take about 10 minutes or so. And then I'm going to hand over to our speakers who will take us through a series of presentations. And then we're going to have hopefully um, some good quality time to have uh, some Q&A. Um, we have got the chat facility, so I'd really encourage everybody who's got a question to type it in the chat. Um, and I'll try and pick up as many of the questions that you've got um, uh, towards the end of this session and direct them to our expert speakers. So thank you. I hope that uh, all makes sense. Uh, if you've got any other questions, do put them in the chat and we'll try and sort them out as we go. Um, so hopefully that's okay. So if we could go on to the next slide, just my title slide for my presentation, if that's okay. Hopefully everybody can see that. So just to set a bit of a scene and a bit of a bit of context, we've obviously had an extraordinary couple of years um, with the COVID pandemic, which certainly isn't over yet, albeit um, it does look like hopefully we're coming out of out of it. Masses of um, um, learning opportunities within that, um, lots of lessons, um, lots of lots of um, um, backlog. Um, but massive uh, opportunity now to uh, not just recover, but to transform the way we do things. And um, I always say every cloud's got a silver lining. And I think the, the developments and the work that we're pushing forward now on virtual wards um, is a massive opportunity that I think has been accelerated um, by the by the pandemic. Um, we um, have seen some amazing new collaborations over the next over the last um, 12, 18 months, we've seen um, massive deployment of technology at a scale we've not seen before. Uh, we're seeing new pathways emerge. So, so really, some really exciting opportunities. And um, I hope today you will you'll hear some of those innovations from our speakers. Um, it'll give you a chance to get a bit of a feel for where we're going and the future direction, uh, but also to hear some of the emerging evidence and some of the sort of the benefits and successes. So I hope that's um, what you'll get out of um, this morning session. So I just wanted to start um, with um, a definition and what do we mean by a, a virtual ward? So we have now set out um, a formal definition. Everybody likes a definition. Um, but I think it is important that we are all talking about the same thing here. So the way we have defined a virtual ward is a safe and efficient alternative to NHS bedded care um, that's enabled by technology. So we, we aren't looking um, um, uh, to effectively replace hospital beds. This is an addition. This is a this is an additional capacity that we're trying to create. Um, they are designed for people that would otherwise be in hospital. And that's a really key point. Um, so they are people that are the most um, in need of acute care, monitoring and treatment, um, usually in their own home, although it could be a care home, but that, that's their usual place of residence. And the primary purposes are essentially around trying to help patient flow. So that's one of the key um, uh, topics of this conversation this morning. So flow being, and we obviously know there's huge pressure on hospitals around trying to see if we can prevent avoidable admissions so people going into hospital, but also to try and support 
earlier discharge. Um, so the step down or the, um, the the way out. So that's largely what this is is all all about. Um, we have within the virtual ward um, different categories or different intensities, if you like. So when people talk about hospital at home, that is a, almost a sub element of a virtual ward. So that's that's for people that do still need that in person care, that hands on care. So they are uh, not just needing virtual care. But actually, you know, their their condition requires them to still have somebody visit them and and, and do some certain things. There are um, lower intensity patients um, um, within virtual wards that can be treated almost entirely virtually and a spectrum in between. But I think it's important to sort of um, stress that actually the virtual ward definition covers um, all of those things. So people that the common bit is they otherwise be in hospital. But there's a spectrum between you know those that can be managed completely virtual versus uh, and or people that need um, do need hands-on care as well so that's that's a key point um just moving on to how that virtual wards fits within the the broader world of virtual healthcare. um through this sort of nhs at home program i'm um, leading we're looking at all of the opportunities for doing much more in people's home through a personalized approach using technology um it's a whole population model so we're looking at how we prevent um, people from um, and staying well, so prevention, um, so um, um, that, that end of the spectrum, right through to helping people with um, long-term conditions and sort of proactive care, through to people that have anticipatory care, complex needs, um, so that the wide range of virtual care before we get into the end of the virtual ward um, um, end of the spectrum. So um, we are looking at this um, in, in the round. Um, we're doing a lot of work around um, perioperative care, particularly in the context of, um, of the waiting list, the 6 million people waiting for waiting lists. And we have just launched today um, our My Planned Care platform, um, which you'll hear a bit more about, um, not on today's webinar, but another time, around how we give patients more information about their weight um, and how they can be better prepared and better informed for their procedures. So that's a, another element of this. And again, another thing that's developed quite a lot over the last um, few months. Um, we have learned a lot through the COVID oximetry and the COVID um, virtual wards, which we'll come back to, um, but really just wanted to place it in this context. In terms of the virtual wards, we um, have, um, there's obviously loads of interesting things, and we'll hear a lot from Andy later on around um, what's going on in, in West Hearts. Um, but we have also been looking at nationally um, some pathways around acute respiratory infections and frailty in particular. Um, but we're not doing that um, in, in an exclusive way. Um, we believe there's so many opportunities and we really want to build this from the ground up in terms of what makes sense clinically and what's happening locally. So um, so that's the, the context. Um, just moving on to um, the next slide in terms of um, benefits. People always want to know um, um, what the benefits of this is. Um, we have a bit of some lovely patient stories. I'm not going to play it now in the interest of time, but you will have access to these slides and you can play it in, in your own time. Um, but what we have seen in terms of benefits and, and evidence is emerging all of the time um, is um, that patients do like them. They are they are um, um, they are um, seen as, as, as safe and effective. Um, people um, are um, starting to demonstrate better outcomes. We're starting to see um, pa um, better patient experience. Um, and we believe from the uh, the staffing ratios and staffing costs that actually um, it, it can be a more cost-effective um, model as well. But again, I'm sure we'll come back um, to, to that a bit later. Um, so um, emerging evidence and, and um, virtual wards, co um, uh, hospital at home isn't a new thing. I mean, they've been going on for a while, but I think the pandemic has accelerated them to a large extent. Um, just moving on to um, the national ambition. Again, um, you're probably all aware that the NHS planning guidance came out on Christmas Eve and sets out the uh, the planning priorities for the year ahead for the for the NHS for 22-23 and within that um, there is a section and an ambition around scaling up virtual wards and a program that we are now um, stepping up. Um, the ambition that we've set out is over the next two years to try and get to about 40 to 50 virtual ward beds per 100,000 population. So if you gross that up, that sort of equates to about a virtual district hospital per ICS or about um, 25,000 patients nationally. So a significant potential increase in capacity will be some challenges in that in terms of how we make that work. And again, we might come back to that. 
Um, and to support and enable that, we are making significant amounts of funding available nationally over the next two years to help realize that ambition. Um, so 200,000 in the year to come and 250,000 in the year following. Um, so just moving on to the next slide. Uh, in terms of current footprint, so as I said, lots of work building on the existing COVID virtual wards um, that we have across the whole country now. Uh, and largely a lot of those now being converted or moved into more uh, broader acute, uh, acute infection, uh, respiratory infection wards, but obviously huge numbers of um, hospital at home, frailty type wards as well. So uh, we're building from a very strong base, as we'll hear again from, from Andy a bit later, um, starting to move into other pathways, other conditions, COPD, heart failure and other, other things. So um, we've really got some momentum um, starting to build here um, and uh, really good to see that we're getting this national picture. Um, moving on again, um, just in terms of sort of summing up in terms of the conclusions. Um, so um, hugely important that we we continue to demonstrate that virtual wards are safe and effective and a, a, and a good alternative to better care. Patients do prefer to be at home where they can, uh, but we need to continue to build that case and, and demonstrate not just the experience, but the efficiency, the effectiveness and the, the improvements to patient flow. Um, we have set out this ambition, which I think gives people something to, to aim at. Um, you know, we're not going to performance manage it, but we do believe that actually, you know, that, that, it, that um, does set out a, a really helpful ambition. We're not being prescriptive around how those beds are used or what for. I think that's for local populations, local uh, organisations to determine in terms of how they use them. And I think we'll see some variation there and some consensus building, but I think it is helpful to sort of have that broader ambition. Um, and we are planning to push out quite a lot more guidance over the next um, 6, 12, 18 months that hopefully makes it easier for local adoption and implementation. So, you know, some big challenges around workforce models, data flow, data collection, reporting, um, you know, how these are operationalized in practice. So we're very keen to share good practice, build consensus and push out uh, further guidance and information materials that will help people learn from those that are um, that are experiencing it at the front. So um, just final slide before I um, wrap up this section. Um, um, again, you'll, you can come back to this, but lots of links to further information if you want to see more detail on anything that I've said in relation to you know, guidance on specific pathways, funding, et cetera, you'll find the answers through these links. So I'm gonna stop there um, and um, just uh, end this first part of the, 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 the presentation. And I'm going to um, hand over, I think, first to John and then um, uh, to Jill, who joined us from Homelink. So welcome to you both. Nice to see you. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have got to say. Um, just to introduce John briefly, John's been um, uh, had a long career in the NHS in senior leadership positions, lots of experience of how it works in practice and has been um, advising Homelink on their, um, their, develop, their development and, um, and strategic ambitions. So then we're going to start with John and then we're going to hand over to Jill, who's the CEO and, and Clinical Director of Homelink uh, for this first section. So over to you, John. Uh, actually, Tim, it's the other way around. Uh, Jill's going to go oh, first. Um, pardon. Sorry, Jill. Uh, that's OK. We like, we like to keep everyone on their toes. That's our sort of job at Homelink. That's what we do. Um, is it, Will the slides come up or do I need to pull them up? Sorry. OK, brilliant. So. First of all, thank you um, everyone for joining us this morning. Um, John and I are absolutely delighted to be part of the panel presentation this morning um, to introduce you a little bit um, to what Homelink Healthcare um, have been doing. So um, particularly uh, over the last couple of years around the development of hospital at home services, um, including virtual wards. So a little bit of background for you um, before we move into the detail of the presentation. So Homelink Healthcare, we're uh, an independent um, healthcare provider. We're specialist in the provision of hospital at home services, as I say, including virtual wards. Um, and we work, um, um, we're very proud to work in partnership with the NHS, um, providing a whole range of hospital at home uh, and virtual ward pathways and services. Uh, we employ um, multidisciplinary teams who, as I say, um, are deployed to visit patients um, at home, working very closely with hospitals to make sure that we can manage uh, patients in the, in the best place for their ongoing care. So I'm going to hand over to John um, for the next few slides um, and then I'll be back with you to share some of the outcome um, data 
from uh, some of our hospital at home and virtual ward services. So, John, over to you. Thank you, Jill. Um, if I just click on to the next slide, if that works. The um, I would really helpful to hear um, Tim's update and Tim's update in terms of the um, the the national direction and. I think it's something that we at Homelink have been saying for probably two or three years. Um, we probably got there a, a couple of years before, before. It is very much what we do. Um, and we've described ourselves as a deliverer of subacute care. We, we recognize that um, there is a gap between community and hospital, and there are a group of patients um, that could be and can be safely managed and safely cared for in their own home. Um, and that's what we've been doing since about uh, late 2018, 2019. And the model clearly has developed over a, a, a substantial period. And I think it's very important that we, and we were very clear when we first set off and, and over that journey of those couple of years, that, that what it meant and what those patients and where they could be safely looked after. And it was very much working with um, partnership of both the hospitals and the community services. Um, we run models that have both uh, that are discharge models where patients are discharged in the community or under the uh, care, of, care of GPs um, and a more commonly used where they aren't discharged and therefore are still under the clinical care of the consultant. Uh, and one of the things that we've learned um, over a long period of time is that relationship and building that trust and building um, the faith in what we do and that those patients remain safe with both the organization but actually the individual clinicians within the organization is, is absolutely essential for us to be able to deliver what we need to if i just move on to the next slide and that Oh, and we clearly technology is um, moving too quickly for me. So in terms of what we look at and look to do, um, we've moved ourselves into a blend of um, clinical expertise. Um, as Jill said, we have a range of um, different professionals, um, healthcare, registered nurses, um, therapists that work collectively together. Um, all are experienced um and one of the questions we often get asked are we just robbing peter to pay paul and we turn up in a, in a in an area and are we recruiting we find that uh we recruit nurses but generally not from the community or for the hospital they come from a no number of different other other areas um very often it's people returning to practice it, it may all be people that um, are wanting a change in their lifestyle um and um we insist that they're X number of years, more than three years post registration, they have community experience, and about a third of our nurses um, actually also have an ITU background, and therefore they're generally quite highly skilled in terms of a workforce. We match that with uh, technology, uh, and I'm sure we can come and talk around uh, what we're doing in Norfolk and Norwich, where they were probably in the van, and I'm sure Tim um, will, we could very happily talk about that in the van in terms of what they're doing in terms of virtual wards. Um, but it's also making sure that we have the analytics and the data that sit behind it and that we make good use of the, the data and the data provision that um, we wrap around those patients so that we can deliver um, safe and effective care. Um, and what do we mean when we say what sort of care we deliver? Um, it's a range of different services and hopefully you can see this. So it's um, either early supported discharge um, we also deliver discharge to assess services, um, but we match that with um, the virtual ward and also we will bring that into a mission avoidance. Um, at, at usually at the front door, but very often that that admission avoidance um, will be in the wider um, uh, emergency zone. So we'll often work with the AMUs and therefore we're um, turning and making best use of SDEC facilities to be able to get people back in the home as soon as possible. Um, and you can see, if you can read on the rest of the slide there, that it's a mix of also of 
um, prehab as well as some reablement services uh, and some high in, uh, high acuity nursing and some into care homes. I think the thing that we would say is the importance is the mix of that face to face and um, the the technology supporting behind it. I know that Tim said that actually they're the, they're the range and, and we absolutely we agree. Um, we talk very much in the language of um, a virtual hospital in the same way that you have a range of acuity across a hospital. Um, we talk very much around that, that uh, at the, the higher end, it is very much the uh, patients that have 24 hour monitoring within that virtual ward, all the way down to the lesser end, which is probably self monitoring. Um, but all of that we provide with a mix of trying to deliver holistic care that will have the carers, the therapists and the nurse all in all in one package so that you're not working with lots of multiple different agencies. The 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 virtual ward patient will have one team and one team managing all their visits across that package. I think I've talked there about the flexibility. Hopefully I also can talk about the scalability. Um, we mainly or we predominantly have been operating in the east of England and um, around London. Um, and the, the diagrams here that I just wanted to show of the, the spread of scale, um, they are um, a 12 month gap. So um, the, the diagram up in the um, top left hand quadrant is the east of England for 2019. Uh, and the bottom box is um, the east of England in 2020. Each of those white or the sorry, the, the blue circles indicate that's where we've been delivering care. And that's where we've been delivering care. Um, the slightly bigger bulges, are, maybe there's two or three in that same postcode where we've delivered care. Um, and you can see, um, if, for those of you that know the geography of Norfolk, um, there's Kings Lynn Hospital off over to the um, over to the west, where you can see quite a bit of a cluster, but then working out from there, Norwich, which is in a central cluster, uh, and then uh, James Paget, which is the more coastal region over into the east. Um, however, probably the, one of the most rural counties in the country, um, you can see there's a real spread across um, what is a very large and very di um, sparsely populated um, area. Over to London on the other side, um, that was um, at the beginning of 2020. Um, you can see where we've been working in the parts of London and you can then see where we've spread that, um, which is um, to the end of this year. So that's the end of 2020. Um, again, a reasonable, a reasonable spread, but it shows the difference of operating in the rural um, and the urban environment. And certainly um, we believe that um, the important thing around complex management around that is not just the clinical care it's also the scheduling the wraparound care how do you make sure the right visits go into the right place and also the information that you provide within those visits get back to the right clinicians so they're able to make those decisions be given the assurity and make sure that this care you're delivering is safe um, i shall move on to the next slide and also move on to jill that's brilliant thanks john um so just building on um so the comments in um, John's presentation, really, um, I think one of the really important things for us around building out our um, hospital at home services, including um, of obviously virtual wards, is that we feel that we're able to address um, and open up um, and address some of the inequalities in access to, to care. Um, because these models are scalable and because they can reach across both rural and, and city areas, um, we like to think that actually um, our services are addressing some of those uh, inequalities and, and access to uh, subacute clinical care. Thinking about, though, the sort of infrastructure in terms of how our hospital at home services are established and how they're set up, um, there's a number of key components that when we certainly set um, set our services up. We work very closely with commissioners to um, co-design and co-produce uh, the appropriate service model for that particular cohort of patients. So we will agree inclusion and exclusion criteria for our virtual wards and hospital at home services. Um, as we know, um, hospital at home um, 
is not appropriate for everyone and we want to make sure that patients who have access to hospital home services are, are the right patients and we can care for them safely. Um, we make sure that all our services are robustly tested um, and we go through a very uh, stringent mobilisation phase and period um, prior to actually going live uh, with our services. Um, underpinning our hospital at home services, we have um, agreed policies, processes and training arrangements with our uh, commissioners. And those are bundled together in an operational manual, which drills out and, and details the actual kind of DNA of how the service works, how referrals are made, how referrals are received, um, etc. And that includes careful documentation around governance and escalation procedures. So bearing in mind that many of our patients um, are, you know, as John rightly says, subacute, so they still have some clinical needs. We want to make sure that if their clinical condition changes, then we're really um, clear about when those patients patients, if they need to be escalated or transferred back into the acute environment, that that can happen quickly and safely. Um, so we have agreed escalation procedures on a patient by patient basis um, for, for those patients in our services. Um, we have our integrated HR and scheduling system. So what does that mean? Well, that means that um, visits are scheduled um, through a, a system called People Planner, which integrates with our uh, competency-based um, HR system. So that means that um, the right clinician can be scheduled um, to meet that particular patient's needs. So, for example, you know, if a patient's receiving IV therapy, then they will only ever be scheduled a nurse that has IV therapy competencies. Um, and that makes the services obviously safe and, and robust. We're also able to um, undertake uh, remote clinical reviews for patients. Um, so we can do that through video technology, which obviously has, has grown over the course of the pandemic. Um, and also we participate in regular MDT reviews um, for our patients and to manage their ongoing care um, at home. And on a monthly basis, we will feed back to our commissioners around the ongoing performance of the service um, or the pathway, not only in terms of um, operational delivery, but also making sure that, um, you know, the quality indicators um, are also uh, reported on. So incidents, um, et cetera, uh, are available for review. So just thinking about, you know, what really matters, and, and that's all about patient outcomes. So um, through um, evaluating care um, for, for our patients in our services, um, we've established that actually patients on our rehab um, therapy pathways actually improve in their clinical conditioning and independence throughout the journey, um, rehabilitation journey with us. Um, that's important because then when patients leave our services, it means that they don't, they're not so dependent on ongoing service provision, either from health or, or social care, um, which obviously is beneficial not only from a patient perspective, but also from a system pers perspective. Um, we're also um, very clear that patients enjoy being cared for at home. So not only in terms of, you know, hard clinical outcomes, but patients, you know, have a very positive experience of home care. Um, each of our patients are offered the opportunity to feedback um, about their experience of home care through a patient satisfaction survey. Um, and that highlights things that have, have gone really well and also areas for improvement and development. So we can build that feedback um, back into the um, ongoing uh, performance and delivery um, of our pathways. I'm sure it won't be a surprise to anyone on this call, but often um, patients who are transferred from hospital to home um, in the hospital at home model are very dependent on care in the early days. And then as they go through their recovery process, they become uh, less dependent. Um, so we find that often um, patients are needing a high degree of monitoring, a high degree of, of, of hands-on clinical care um, for the first sort of days and weeks. And then as they you know, improve and their condition stabilise, then that, uh, that input can be tailed off. And finally, then, just before we hand over, um, just to say, really, that obviously from a hospital at home perspective, um, as we've said, virtual wards is one component of that, where we believe that in you know, a hospital at home and virtual wards are best delivered through a combination of clinical care, um, so, you know, supported by, you know, um, technology. And that delivers benefits not only for patients themselves and being 
given a choice of where they can um, have their ongoing care, but also from a teams and, and systems perspective as well. Um, thank you very much. I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Let me, I, um, thank you, John Jill. I think my camera has failed, so apologies if you can't see me, but hopefully you can hear me. So yeah, I'd just like to introduce um, um, Dr. Andrew Barlow, who's the Director of Medicine at West Hearts, and I'm um, really pleased to hear what you've got to say. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Tim. Um, could I have my slides loaded, or do you want me to do that? Um, <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, so first, the first thing to say really is that in this evolution of uh, virtual ward development, um, there's a wider team sitting behind people like me. And uh, among the, the many people that have contributed to virtual wards at, at our hospital, uh, Alex Newland-Smith deserves uh, great credit. Uh, he's our senior physiologist and he's been heart and soul of the, the virtual ward program here in our hospital. Um, those are my conflicts of interest, uh, which uh, are minimal if non-existent. Um, so we all know the we all know the story, don't we? Two years ago, uh, nearly, we had this uh, avalanche of viral infections sweeping uh, westwards across, across Europe, and uh, me and many other colleagues listened to some of the heart-wrenching podcasts. Um, coming particularly from Italy and R Roberta Cosentini's uh, podcast is is chilling even now on a re-listen uh, about their experiences in Lombardy. Um, and that set us to thinking about how our hospitals were going to cope with the, uh, the COVID um, infection problem. Um, through some very much back of envelope calculations, we rapidly... Uh, came to the conclusion that our hospital base was not going to be big enough to to manage uh, all of these patients and that really was the birth of the COVID virtual hospital uh, that's not to say that virtual wards or hospitals didn't exist elsewhere and they're, they're commonplace in uh, in Europe and the States uh, and Australasia um, so this is not this is not a, a genuine first but uh, it was uh, the first applied to uh, COVID. Um, in those days, in, that, in the heat of battle, um, it was incredibly easy uh, to put new services in place um, with all the red tapes stripped away. Uh, it was uh, conceived and, and uh, devised on the 9th of March and we onboarded our first patient into the West Hearts COVID ward on the 14th of March. And then the rest is history. Um, we were subject and name checked on a BMJ article in June um, we were one of the four, four main contributors to a big uh, review by uh, Na Naomi Fulop's group, um, identifying that COVID virtual ward practice was, a, was a, indeed a safe and effective way of managing these patients. Um, and then NHS England uh, 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 came in recommending that uh, this ought to be something rolled out across uh, the rest of the country. And of course, by then, many other hospitals had started their own. Um, and that, that takes us back, that takes us very nicely to this December last year, where uh, minds began to be drifting toward uh, expanding virtual ward programs to other disease entities. And indeed, we'd been planning our new virtual ward uh, since January 2021. So it, just, it took us 11 months to put the second one into place uh, compared to four, uh, five days for the first. Um, I'm just going to spend a couple of, couple of slides on, on, on what the original virtual ward looked like and every virtual ward needs a patient pathway and this was genuinely the first cut, the first designed pathway for uh, COVID patients for a disease entity we knew nothing about um, and had no, no experience of. And that brings me to stress the importance about uh, data and evidence because if I was a patient being put into a new care program, I'd want to know from either me or my relative that uh, this was a safe and effective way of being managed. Um, so we set about publishing our, our experiences and data, and this was published in BMJ Open, 
and is a, and is a paper showing what happened with the first 900 patients put through our COVID virtual ward. Now, the take home message from this, <clears throat> there's a lot of data on the slide here, but the thing I want to stress here is that firstly, these patients weren't fit well 40 year olds with no, no comorbidities. Many of them had two or three significant chronic health conditions. Um, they had a wide range of ages. And so th th this was a potentially a difficult patient group. Uh, and overall, um, on the first cut of the 900, uh, our readmission rate at 90 days was 8%, um, with a very low mortality. In fact, now uh, I can tell you that our readmission, our readmission rate is somewhere around 2% 2, 2 at 90 days. That's important because when you look at national data um, and uh, look at the 90-day readmission rate for COVID patients nationally, it was at 30%. So there's something about our care model which radically reduced uh, patients' subsequent need to attend uh, emergency hospital services. And lastly, in terms of data, uh, it's very important to know who to put into a virtual hospital and who to actually admit when you're looking at admission prevention. And uh, this was our paper published in Thorax um, using complex multi-regression multi analysis, uh, which generated a very simple scoring system, which enabled us to effectively stratify patients who are safe to put into a virtual domain as, as opposed to actually requiring hospital admission. And that was the first, first, uh, first and only short score to be used uh, in ED published to date. And, and that was then subsequently integrated into all our care pathways. And there's a, that's a, a screenshot of uh, how that scoring system then enables us to make decision make decisions at the front door. Um, and you can see in the table there our overall admission rate and mortality in wave one and wave two um, with the, and, and the patient numbers. So that brings us be, uh, beginning to bring, bring us to present day. Um, the first uh, version of our COVID virtual hospital was, was pretty rudimentary, uh, didn't require anything particularly complex um, uh, over and above a pulse oximeter. We, we rapidly integrated um, a, a healthcare management system where the patient could in, interface with the consultants and specialists in the hospital. And that was, that was provided by uh, Humor Medopad. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the database and the, the, the platform for the management of the patients evolved rapidly and became much more sophisticated. At the heart of it, though, is the patient. And I think in any, any talk I give on uh, the use of virtual wards and technology and monitoring, uh, it's important to stress that the patient is at the heart of this. For a hospital clinician, it's very easy to uh, become a little bit uh, immune or blasé to uh, what a what a hospital mission actually means for a patient, and I I, I often ask my friends who have similar uh, similar uh, uh, vintage to me uh, how do they, how they think they'd feel if they were suddenly admitted to hospital without without any warning, um, and I think it then begins to dawn on people just how how frightening this is, and and for that individual, every single admission really constitutes uh, a major health crisis and a major crisis in their life. And if you start beginning to treat every single admission in that way, um, then that enables us to focus on what these patients really need. And I'll come on to why that's important a bit later. This is data for uh, nationally and, and, and locally for COPD. And it's just to point out that at West Hearts, we, we'd routinely admit 1,500 patients a year with COPD with an average length of stay of five to six days. Uh, so we're, we're, we're talking about upwards of 10,000 bed days um, for the hospital. Uh, many of those patients actually are relatively short, um, less than four days and less than two days. And that provides the opportunity to say, well, what if we did things differently? Could we, short, uh, for those patients that needed admission, and stabilization, could we shorten their length of stay safely? 
and other a group of patients that we could, uh, could manage completely differently and not admit at all. And this is where the concept of using the virtual ward comes in. At the heart of our Aries disease service, which we've renamed ABC, asthma, bronchiectasis, and CAPD, um, is an MDT. And uh, that, that runs three times a week, soon to run five times a week. And it is a truly integrated um, MDT uh, with the following important healthcare professionals involved. Specialists like me and our trainees, inpatient specialist nurses, community nurses, uh, who provide a similar service to HomeLink, uh, physiotherapists, uh, non-invasive ventilation practitioners, senior nurses, GPs, palliative care consultants. So when I say we've got a broad church uh, sitting in our MDT, uh, I really mean it. And the purpose of the MDT is to discuss every single acute admission um, that's come to our hospital with these, with these clinical problems. And that's where I begin to tap into the comment I made earlier about recognizing that every admission is the most important crisis for that patient that's probably occurred to them in their lifetime uh, and to treat it as such. So the purpose of the MDT is to provide some diagnostic clarity, um, identify uh, urgent uh, investigations that patient might require, either inpatient or outpatient, and then to put in place a short, medium and long-term care package, a holistic care package, identifying and recognising that their needs are not just medical, but social as well. For a small group or a group of those patients we discuss, we, we, we confirm and agree that they would be candidates for the new COPD virtual ward. And this is our first uh, crude cut of a, what, what a pathway looks like. Um, rather than focusing on the pathway itself, I just wanted to uh, identify that, you know, we have a broad range of key, uh, key stakeholders and this 11 month uh, program that, that took to, it, it took to put in place involved commissioners, obviously our own trust exec, the exec of um, the community, part, uh, community uh, uh, partnership that uh, it's a separate trust um, and, and all the involved teams, include, including voluntary sector and uh, primary care. We see these virtual wards not only as an extension of care uh, from hospital, but an a, 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 a vehicle to recognize that the patient needs an extended care package. Uh, and during that time, opportunity is created to uh, enforce and put in place major health changing life interventions um, and reinforce important messages. And we think that it's probably that kind of softer element of care in the COVID story that dropped our readmission rates because we were able to identify problems during that time that we wouldn't have otherwise had uh, to then uh, intervene and prevent uh, further crises down the line. Now, I introduced you the concept of um, a scoring systems to help us de decide who was and wasn't safe to put into the COVID virtual hospital. We're using a similar established scoring, sy scoring system um, for our CAPD virtual hospital um, for admission prevention. And uh, that's an, uh, the DCAF score is an established score. I put these numbers in just to focus people's minds that the group that we're dealing with here is, is a, actually a very, uh, uh, carries a high comorbid burden um, and an acute admission with COPD carries a, a, a death risk, a mortality risk, which should not be underestimated and just goes to show the level of clinical jeopardy we're considering here in not admitting a patient. Um, you know, to give you an example, a DCAF score of three at the front door uh, is 15% is chance of um, in, uh, in, in hospital death. So if we were to put that patient at home You've got to start thinking, well, what is, you know, well, what are the risks that we're undertaking here? And that's why data collection is going to be very important um, over the next few months. Um, and we're pleased to uh, be part of a 
collaboration with the Academic Health Science Network and NHSX, we're undertaking a rapid evaluation of this service uh, right now. And we hope to publish that in May, June of this year. Just to give you an idea of the staffing models that we, we have in place to deliver this service, we've got a, some, a tool, two full-time band six specialist nurses and two band four uh, administrators, and they work seven days a week. We have a community nurse, nurse phone line, which is, is manned nine till eight with, with an answer phone and guaranteed call back the next day. Every patient on the virtual ward receives a consultant ward round. Um, uh, and there is also 24-7 uh, availability of uh, phone advice uh, from that consultant uh, by any, any healthcare professional that needs it. It's not direct patient to consultant, it's healthcare to consultant. Uh, we have a community, big community nursing team, volunteer service, and of course, GPs. Um, and we have a small team of inpatient airways disease and heart failure specialist nurses. In our virtual ward on discharge, we can offer a range of investigations, um, in, uh, including blood tests, uh, arterial blood gas analysis, and a range of treatments, including oxygen, IV antibiotics, and nebulizers. Uh, in terms of technology, um, we've got a, 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 a care pathway uh, integrated onto something called um, Inflex, which is a, a common management system across the NHS. But importantly, it gives a clear line of sight for all clinicians caring for the patient, be they doctor, nurse, physio, GP. Everybody's got access, uh, ability to see what's happened to the patient and input their own uh, uh, insights. Uh, patients are discharged on uh, monitoring using Massimo technology, which provides up to 10 days of continuous monitoring uh, on a number of different physiological parameters, providing a very rich database of healthcare information. We also provide basic oximetry as a standby if the Massimo technology fails for whatever reason. Um, the governance sits within my division, but uh, at a wider level in the integrated care service, there is a new hospital at home steering group, um, which will oversee uh, these programs in all the, all the relevant trusts within that ICS. Um, this is a sort of picture uh, of what it looks like to be a patient on the pathway over the seven days that we run it. Um, and you can see that they, they, get, they get input from the consultant daily. Uh, there's ongoing mo monitoring with Massimo. Um, there is a input from a community nurse. That's a physical visit on day one. And then from there, the nursing requirements are defined and it might be daily, it might be on day three and day seven. Um, they might, re might require physiotherapy or other inputs. We give the patients the opportunity to link in with the volunt voluntary sector, um, and that's an, an additional hand-holding uh, element to the service. And, the, and the, volu the, the volunteers are very good at signposting patients to uh, wider healthcare uh, opportunities um, uh, in, in the locality. These are pictures of uh, uh, the first patient we onboarded. Um, no, no patient information is uh, visible. Um, the top left screen just shows you the, the, what kind of uh, information that we can see on our, our, our dashboard in our, in our hub, in our monitoring hub. And we, we, we know what the patient's ox oxygen levels are, pulse, blood pressure, and many other parameters continuously 24 hours a day. Um, the nurses contact the patients four hours a day and get snapshot data. Um, and there's an, there's an ability for the patient to contact the nurse um, if, if, there are, if they have issues. Uh, moreover, the nurses review all the data for the patients the first thing in the morning, and, and by doing so, prioritise the ward rounds the consultants will then do. Um, please focus on the right-hand table here, and this is just the, roughly the numbers to date. Uh, we've been running since just before Christmas, um, when we put through about 56 patients, um, 12 were admission prevention, 42 were facilitated discharge. As, as of today, our readmission rate is 1.7%, and we've had one death, sadly, but that was an expected death in a patient with uh, significant comorbidities. Um, I've already stated that the Academic Health Science Network is uh, helping us with a rapid evaluation. And that data is important because not every 
colleague in, in the UK believes this is a good or safe thing to do. And in any new service, there are a range of people from the vanguard, the, uh, vanguard, the early adopters, and then the sort of late, late sort of joiners uh, who wait and see what the data looks like. So publishing in peer-reviewed journals outcomes for services like this is actually crucial for gaining um, momentum uh, locally and nationally and expanding uh, these these services. Uh, and I'll stop there and uh, hand back to Tim. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Jill and John, some really thought provoking presentations, loads of stuff to digest, loads of data, loads of good experience and, uh, and learning. Thank you. So we, we haven't got long left for Q and A's, 10 minutes or so, but we have got some really good questions in the chat. And apologies again, you can't see me, but uh, my camera's failed somehow, but um, we'll push on. So I just want to um, pick up um, the questions, I think more in um, in order, just uh, probably first one for, for um, Jill, if that's okay. The one, the question from Jane Smith, just talking about patient stories and patient context and the, the, their wider um, their wider needs and, and sort of um, um, wants to know around particularly the, the issue of social isolation and how that might be factored into uh, as a risk or, you know, in terms of how you're assessing whether someone's um, um, suitable for this um, sort of service. So you mentioned around inclusion, exclusion criteria. Just wondered if you could say a little bit about that. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no problem. So um, um, as we've heard, you know, the kind of assessing criteria um, for virtual wards is absolutely critical in terms of, of running the ward safely. Um, so when we are setting up a virtual ward, we work with the clinicians in the trust um, that we that we you know, that we develop in the service and in agree basically the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So that might be around um, uh, particular diseases, particular uh, specialties um, and, and those sorts of things, really. So there aren't I can't give you kind of hard and fast rules, um, but um, as we've heard from um, in the presentations as well, what's really important is that, you know, we look at the patient's care holistically. So administering medicines and, you know, managing medications, etc., is obviously really important. But what's also, you know, critically important is that, you know, when those acute medical needs have been managed and supported and the patient's recovering, is then that ongoing social um, or indeed healthcare support is provided. So we will assess our patients holistically throughout their journey with us on the virtual ward. And if there are any ongoing um, social needs um, at the end of the patient's sort of medical treatment, then we will make sure that the patient is, is handed on or referred on to um, services that will meet those, meet those needs. Fantastic, thank you. And just a, another question for you, if that's OK, a few questions coming through around um, staffing and, 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 and how we um, uh, and how we provide these 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 services. Can you say a little bit more around? Um, uh, I think it's a question from um, 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 Steph Watt around uh, staffing ratios and and, uh, and and another question, I think, from Tracy around um, uh, and, and how, how the sort of workforce model is made up. Yeah, of course, no problem at all. So um, <clears throat> in terms of workforce mod model, um, our workforce is comprised of 80% um, registered practitioners, um, and that will be registered nurses, therapists, and then 20% um, 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 healthcare support workers and reablement support workers. So that's the broad composition of our workforce. Um, in terms of um, staffing ratios, then we, um, our model is based on an individual nurse or therapist or, or healthcare support worker being able to visit um, up to four patients a day. Um, so we make sure that you know the visits are scheduled in an uh, in an efficient and effective way, so that we maximise patient facing time and minimise you know travelling time. Um, but but that's how the the sort of you know the, the the daily run, if you like, of a of a clinician's day is set out. And um, four visits a day, the clinicians will know in advance the day before the patients that they're visiting the next day. Those are those, as I say, scheduled on an electronic scheduling system. Um, called uh, People Planner, 
Um, all our notes for the patients are held electronically. Um, so there's visibility across multidisciplinary teams um, of the patient record, which obviously improves um, safety and, and access to those to that vital information. Um, and, and wrapped around our um, service, we also have a 24-7 clinical on-call service. So if any of our patients need you know, help or advice, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's um, a clinician at the end of the phone that can that can signpost um, that patient according to their needs. Thank you. No, that's great. Um, question probably for Andrew, because I know you love data and counting and, uh, and how all of that works. A question from Lizzie Poole, really, around um, if a patient needs escalating into a hospital setting, how, how do you capture the admission method? not so it doesn't affect your admission uh, readmissions rates so just yeah what, what are your thoughts around that and probably more generally around you know how we count things because i know that's something that's um, one of the challenges you've been thinking and something we're trying to help with as well yeah thanks that's very a very topical question so um at the moment there's no way to um, formally code for uh, a virtual ward admission so uh, if you take the example of a, of a standard inpatient uh, and you want to put them onto a virtual ward, you have two choices, either to formally discharge, discharge them on your hospital administration system um, and then use a, a surrogate code um, for their, their stay in the, in the virtual ward, or you leave them on the, your administration system uh, as you let them leave hospital and go home. But of course, if you do that, then uh, your data subsequently will look like um, you have very long lengths of stay for the particular health condition you're managing. Um, so uh, we are we're, we are currently opting at, uh, opt, uh, opted to uh, go down the, the route of discharging and then using a surrogate code, which isn't right for it. It's one of the uh, uh, day case codes, I think. Um, uh, however, we're, um, I'm hoping Tim and colleagues will be providing some more uh, more fit for purpose coding structures uh, in in due course. Uh, in terms of the readmission uh, question, I'm not quite sure what the question is really driving at. Um, all I would say is that it's important to capture your readmission rate and to be honest about it, um, because that will inform how you should. Uh, a review and potentially evolve your pathway, evolve your pathways in the future. Um, if I had a new pathway that had a high admission, readmission rate, I would want to look at the reasons why and make some changes. So, actually, it's really important to track that um, and then reflect on any changes that are required. I think we may have lost Tim. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a, another question um, that's coming from Steph Watt. Uh, could Homelink please give an idea of the numbers of people being supported and the staffing um, ration um, impressive patient feedback and how many people is that based on, please? Yeah, sure. So um, the data we've shared today is feedback from uh, 47 patients in our care this week. Um, so in addition to the end of um, episode patient satisfaction survey, we also ask our patients, um, at least on a weekly basis, about their experience of care. And the data that you've seen today um, comes from that, that weekly roundup for one of our services in London. I can probably uh, <coughs> jump in and add some further colour. Um, uh, to date, we're somewhere just short of 6,000 patients that we put through our COVID virtual ward programme, uh, which is now nearly two years uh, old. Uh, and as you saw, about uh, just under 60 patients to date in the Airways Disease and Heart Function virtual ward. Um, and patient feedback uh, uh, and views are very much part of the uh, qualitative assessment that the Academic Health Science Network is facilitating in their rapid evaluation. Ace. Um, there's a few more questions um, to go through. I'm just cautious on, on time. 
Uh, one that kind of stands out for me is, are these patients screened for malnutrition as they would be if they were admitted to a ward? Uh, shall I pick that up first and then um, Jill or John uh, might want to add. Um, we are in the first phase of uh, this new virtual ward for us and actually so it's primarily uh, early discharge patients and so all the dietetic and social assessments that any patient would undergo on their process of discharge from a main hospital, that is done as well. Um, so there is no substitution of, of the usual process uh, that every patient needs on discharge. And if they have dietetic needs, then that would be assessed before discharge with community plans put in place. But Jill or John, do you want to add to that? Well, only to reinforce, really. Um, so the services that we deliver are exactly the same. Um, so that full range of holistic and specialist assessments um, are, are you know, provided for our patients, the feedback taken, an ongoing plan, uh, care planned on the basis of that. OK, um, I'd just like to say thank you to all of our presenters. Um, you've done a, a, a very, very good job. Uh, we have lost Tim, so that's the reason why I, I, I'm presently speaking. Um, <clears throat> but I'd just like to thank everyone for attending the webinar and any of the additional questions that, are, that haven't been answered, uh, we should be able to follow up um, in, in email. So, uh, yeah, thanks for everyone uh, attending and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Cheers.